Well, thank you very much. And let me apologize to everybody for being late. Um, uh, anyway, good morning and welcome. Thank you for attending this important hearing on human rights in Indonesia. I want to thank uh, J.P. Schuster and the staff of the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission for organizing this hearing. I also want to thank our witnesses for testifying and, uh, and for everything that they do to uh, advance the protections of human rights in Indonesia. This week, 15 years ago, uh, President Soeharto resigned as President of Indonesia. That event marked an end to over four decades of authoritarian rule at the beginning of what has become Indonesia's remarkable transition to a civilian-led democracy. In the years since, Indonesia has held two direct presidential elections and two nationwide parliamentary elections, each of which was seen as largely free and fair. Indonesia has also managed the difficult task of considerably lessening the role of its military in domestic affairs and internal security. So in this context, Indonesia has seen improvements that were thought to be unimaginable by some just two decades ago. Specifically, Indonesia has experienced a deep decentralization of power to local authorities, the rise of highly active media and civil society, and a general improvement in the protection of human rights, including in the areas with a history of successionist movements. Importantly, such improvements led in part to the decision of the U.S. to sign a bilateral comprehensive partnership agreement with Indonesia in November of 2010. However, despite such admirable progress and our improved relations with Indonesia, significant challenges remain. In Indonesia, uh, as Indonesia has decentralized political power and improved its human rights record, it has also failed to control local military and police units, for which it remains responsible um, or effectively uh, punish those who violate human rights. Credible reports indicate that Indonesia's police have committed torture and other ill treatment, unnecessary and excessive use of force when carrying out arrests, and unlawful killings. Investigations into reports of police abuses are also rare, and police often, uh, and police often subject uh, complainants to further intimidation and harassment. I am, all, I am also especially concerned about the increasing harassment, intimidation, and attacks against religious minorities in, in Indonesia. In particular, the Ahmadiyya um, uh, have uh, faced increased uh, maltreatment in recent years. I was especially disturbed to learn of a February 2011 inc incident in which a mob of 1,500 people brutally attacked an, uh, an Ahmadi community in Banten resulting in the death of three people, as local police made practically no effort to intervene. I am also troubled by violence and discrimination against Christians, especially in West Java, in the, in West Java province, where local officials have used their licensing powers to, dis, to discriminatorily prevent the building of churches, in one case despite a ruling by the National Supreme Court that there were no grounds for sealing off the disputed building sites. Also of concern is, what's going, uh, is the ongoing tension um, in West uh, Papua, uh, between the re region's indigenous uh, Mel Melanesian uh, people and in in Indonesia's security forces. In April 2009, the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission held its first of a series of hearings on the, on the uh, rights of indigenous peoples, which included witnesses from West Papua. We heard testimony describing the violence and repression endured by indigenous peoples by mul multinational mining and timber companies backed up by the full force of the Indo Indonesian military, police, and local officials. I remain deeply concerned that the situation is not improved, and I find it very problematic that some military officers charged with human rights-related offenses have been tried in military courts, which manifestly lack sufficient independence and impartiality, and that military officers suspected of such offenses are charged with disciplinary rather than criminal offenses. In August of 1999, I traveled to Indonesia to, and met with President Habibi. I went to East Timor to review the uh, preparations for the historic referendum on independence in East Timor and investigate the human rights situation. As we all remember, horrible violence was let loose against the people of East Timor immediately after they voted for freedom. Hundreds of people, including many I had just met, were murdered by Indonesian-supported militias and security forces. Today. Uh, uh, Timor uh, Leste is a free and independent nation, and the United Nations has recently withdrawn the last of its peacekeeping forces, and it lives side by side with Indonesia in friendly relations. It would be wrong to overlook the significant progress Indonesia has made over the past 50 years or the significance of our improved relationship with Indonesia. 
but it is also important that we use today to address the ongoing issues that threaten our mutual interests in achieving respect for human rights and the rule of law in Indonesia. In doing so, I hope uh, we not only use this opportunity to clarify uh, the high standard to which we hold our international partners, but to also remind ourselves of the high standards to which universal human rights norms hold all countries, including the United States. So having said that, I'm happy to welcome uh, our first panel, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, Dan Baer, uh, Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor at the U.S. Department of State, and Susan Sutton, the Office of, Office of Maritime uh, Southeast Asia, U.S. Department of State. We welcome you both here uh, and look forward to your testimony. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for all that you do personally to make sure that, that human rights stays in the spotlight uh, here on the Hill and, and for our government at large. You've certainly been uh, a leader, and we thank you for your leadership uh, from the Hill. It's made our work easier. I'd also like to pay tribute to the late Tom Lantos, for whom this commission is named, and, and his work on behalf of human rights for so many years. It's a pleasure to testify today with my colleague, Susan Sutton. Uh, I appreciate the interest in Indonesia and State Department officials both in Washington and in Indonesia have clearly communicated that the United States believes that the respect for universal human rights is essential to Indonesia's strong future. Under Secretary Wendy Sherman was in, in Jakarta earlier this week and discussed a broad range of important issues including human rights. Also earlier this week during the rollout of the International Religious Freedom uh, Report, uh, Secretary of State Kerry said, religious freedom is a core American value that is not an American invention, but rather a birthright of every human being. Indonesia has enjoyed a reputation for respect for religious pluralism. However, an increase in societal attacks by extremist groups and violence toward members of religious minorities, along with ineffective government responses, are threatening to tarnish that, in that image. The Satara Insti Institute reported 226 cases of interference with religious freedom by non-state actors in 2012, compared to 194 the previous year. The 2008 anti-Ahmadiyya decree freezes certain activities of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community and bans proselytizing by members of the group. In 2012, a number of regional governments enforced decrees limiting or banning the free practice of the Ahmadiyya Muslim religion. In 2011, as you mentioned, three Ahmadiyya Muslims were beaten to death by a mob of more than 1,500, while police failed to intervene. Ultimately, the convicted perpetrators received light sentences of four to six months, while an injured Ahmadi victim was sentenced to seven months for allegedly provoking the attack. Another disturbing trend is the number of closures of churches and Ahmadiyya mosques, an issue that is again exacerbated by restrictive laws. The 2006 decree on the, constructions of, uh, the construction of houses of worship is not meant to be retroactive, but has often been used by extremist groups to encourage the closing of religious buildings established prior to 2006. Approximately 50 churches were forcibly closed across Indonesia in 2012. One church was demolished in March of this year and four Ahmadiyya mosques were closed in April of this year, and another was for forced to close this week. Blasphemy, blasphemy laws used to restrict religious freedoms and, uh, and freedom of expression are also part of the problem. After a Shia cleric was sentenced to four years in prison for, quote, deviant teachings, approximately 300 of his followers were, were resettled to a sports complex in Sampang. Our embassy and consulate continue to press local officials in Madura, East Java, to allow the 200 remaining Shia to return to their homes. While some instances of violence occur con uh, along sectarian lines, the underlying causes are often more complex, including rule of law issues, political manipulation, and land issues. To tackle increasing intolerance toward members of religious minorities, these underlying issues must be addressed. Although extremist groups are loud, they speak for a very small, narrow minority. The majority of Indonesians support religious tolerance and mutual respect. In terms of other civil and political rights, Indonesia is headed in the right direction. The vast majority of Indonesians are able to say and publish what they want, to criticize their government, to peacefully change their leaders, to assemble and associate as they see fit. However, significant challenges remain. Some of the laws governing online expression are vague and can be interpreted in ways that violate human rights. The government continues to apply treason and conspiracy statutes to criminalize nonviolent political speech that it deems separatist. Over 80 individuals remain in jail, some serving lengthy sentences and many suffering harsh treatment on these kinds of political charges. In 2012, during Indonesia's Universal Periodic Review at the UN, uh, at the Human Rights Council, we called on Indonesia to end enforcement of and to repeal the, the relevant provisions of its criminal code. Consensual same-sex sexual activity is illegal in Indo Indonesia, and many local regulations spe 
uh, especially criminalize it along the uh, same lines as prostitution. A local Jakarta ordinance allows police to classify any transgender person as a sex worker. Members of the LGBT community are harassed by police and coerced to play, pay bribes to avoid detention. And as is often the case in Indonesia, police and local officials routinely defer decisions on physical protection, investigation of crimes, and protection of rights to extremist groups. The human rights enjoyed by most Indonesians are less well protected in conflict-affected and ethnic and religious minority areas. In Aceh and in in Indonesia's far west, the significant progress spurred by the 2005 Helsinki Peace Agreement could be accelerated if national and local authorities established the Truth Commission and Human Rights Courts provided for by the 2006 Aceh Law. In Indonesia's Far East, as you mentioned, historical grievances and deliberate social and economic marginalization continue to fuel a decades-old low-intensity insurgency in Papua and West Papua provinces. Armed insurgents, unarmed civilians, and members of security services are routinely injured and killed in sporadic violence. The past commission of serious human rights violations by Indonesian security forces in Jakarta, East Timor, Aceh, and Papua, and elsewhere has been widely publicized. Today, we see that Indonesia's defense and police establishments have broken with that model and are transforming. Professionalization and accountability are improving, but not complete, and backsliding is a possibility. Today, human rights violations committed by Indonesian military and police are not command-driven or widespread. In recent years, we've seen several cases of small groups of relatively low-ranking personnel committing very serious crimes, including murder and torture. The government investigates those cases and, in a break from the past, has prosecuted some perpetrators. We welcome these steps, but it is important to note that accountability is incomplete because, in most cases, the perpetrators are charged with a minor offense and do not receive a sentence commensurate with the actual violent crime committed. We've seen recently the government's willingness, in some cases, to court-martial the perpetrators after they've completed their prison sentence. We are watching very carefully the military's investigation of the March 2013 attack on a prison in central Java in which several guards were injured and four prisoners were executed. Eleven Kopasis personnel have been arrested, and the conduct of the investigation and trial and punishment of the perpetrators will speak volumes about the extent of the cultural shift underway within the military. Indonesia is poised to be one of the most important countries of the 21st century if they continue their democratic progress. Many democratic changes are irreversible, and the overwhelming majority of Indonesians and most government officials want a rights-respecting, peaceful, and inclusive society. However, many reforms are works in progress, and backsliding on some of the most critical advancements is possible. Indonesia has many partners and friends, including the United States, and of course, as elsewhere, the strongest partners of the Indonesian government come from within, the civil society organizations and advocates journalists, and others who, by pushing the government to do better, help cement the considerable gains made by and for the Indonesian people. I thank you again for exploring these vitally important issues and giving me the opportunity to testify today and welcome your questions. Well, well thank you very much for your excellent testimony, and now we'll hear from Ms. Sutton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for inviting me to testify here today on human rights in Indonesia. I'm happy to be here with my colleague, Dan Baer. Our two bureaus work together very productively on this issue. Um, as it turns out, in uh, much of my prepared testimony, you have actually already covered a lot of the things that I was going to say, so I'm going to try to summarize as I go. Um, as you note, it's 15 years since President Suharto stepped down after 32 years in power. It's actually 15 years almost to the day. It was May 21st, and I think a lot of us remember that day. It's worth remembering, however, that in many ways, 1998 was a terrible year in Indonesia. Jakarta saw massive riots that targeted members of the ethnic Chinese community. Hundreds of people died, and many businesses were burned or looted in violence, widely understood to be fomented by the Indonesian military. Our human rights report for the year detailed close to 200 attacks, many fatal, on moderate Muslim religious leaders, as well as on suspected practitioners of black magic. The following year wasn't much better. In 1999, in Moluku, over 1,000 people died in intercommunal warfare between groups of Christians and Muslims. And in East Timor, as you've recounted, there was a terrible aftermath of the independence referendum. Even with that grim example, movements in Aceh and Papua continued to clamor for independence, with some elements in each resorting to violence. As the new millennium began, some Indonesians feared their country was destined for unending chaos or even disintegration. So it's useful at this anniversary to take a look at what Indonesia has become since that turning point in 1998, and particularly in regards to human rights. And I would echo very much the, the comments that you made. 
Um, Indonesia today is an electoral democracy, the only country in Southeast Asia ranked fully free by Freedom House. The U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom points to Indonesia's vibrant media, which allows for a free market of religious ideas and publication. It points out that the majority of Indonesia's diverse religious communities operate openly and with few restrictions, although our State Department Religious Freedom Report adds that members of groups within those denominations espousing views deemed deviant or blasphemous do not always enjoy the same freedoms. I think that as you look at Indonesia's strengths and weaknesses, you see a flourishing of civil liberties enjoyed by most Indonesians, but not equally enjoyed by all. The range of topics acceptable for free debate. Okay. The range of topics acceptable for free debate and discussion is far more open than in the past, but it's not limitless. Indonesia's made good progress enshrining the principles of civil rights in its law and in implementing them fairly widely but it has not yet succeeded in ensuring they are respected in the hardest cases, especially those cases when they fear that doing so may lead to societal conflict. And thus, as uh, Dan pointed out, we see restrictions on proselytizing and blasphemy. Many Indonesians accept these restrictions as measures to prevent intercommunal conflict and to ensure respect for traditions that they hold dear, but they run afoul of freedoms of expression and religion. Some religious minority congregations face obstacles in regards to their ability to build new houses of worship or keeping existing ones open, particularly due to a 2006 decree requiring them to get approval from members of other religious groups in the community. Despite a wider area for political debate, some forms of nonviolent political speech are criminalized. Political parties may campaign loudly against the government, but activists in Papua have been imprisoned for campaigning peacefully for independence from the state. Um, as you heard, NGOs have reported over 200 cases of abuses of religious freedom by non-state actors in 2012. Of particular concern are these cases, such as the ones you mentioned, which involve violent attacks against members of religious minorities by extremist groups, such as the Islamic Defenders Front. In a number of documented cases, local officials and police have not protected the victims of these assaults. Governments aren't responsible for the prejudices of their citizens. Every country has intolerant people. But they are responsible for protecting every citizen's right to be secure in his person, regardless of his ethnicity or beliefs. To achieve that goal, the Indonesian government must overcome a long tradition of impunity for government officials and for security forces who neglect their duties, engage in corruption, or themselves participate in human rights violations. The government of Indonesia deserves credit for the progress it has made in improving the human rights record of its security forces, but appropriately punishing offenders has proven to be one of the most difficult reforms to institute. This lack of deterrence through accountability has weakened overall reform efforts. Looking ahead, I see some reasons for concern in the short term and reasons for optimism in the longer term. Indonesia will hold elections next year. Election campaigns can call out the worst in political leaders who find appeals to ethnic or religious identity to be an easy way to win votes. Papa was granted special autonomous status in 2001, but there is still no resolution of the conflict there. We support the territorial integrity of Indonesia. We believe that a sincere response from the government to the Papuans desire for dialogue to promote peace and reconciliation will strengthen, not weaken, Indonesia's security and unity. We should also be encouraged by the fact that the leadership of Indonesia itself acknowledges the imperative to promote tolerance, not to satisfy international critics, but to answer to the expectations of its own people, as Dan pointed out. In a speech last month, Indonesian President Yudhoyono said, like all Indonesians, I know that harmonious relations among our diverse ethnic and religious groups is of supreme importance to our national survival. We must continue to work hard to maintain moderation, pluralism, and tolerance in our society. So from the ma'am and chaos of the late 90s, Indonesia's built a functioning democracy. It's improved the respect for human rights of its citizens. Now it needs to keep on. It needs to go forward on the path it chose in 98 when its people rejected authoritarian rule. It needs to build on its successes so far to firmly establish democratic governance and to ensure that the rights of all its citizens are equally respected. The United States looks forward to supporting that process in the future as we have since it began. So thank you for holding the hearings. Well, thank you for your, for your testimony. I appreciate it, both of you. Um, 
those buzzers um, were votes. But what I want to try to do is kind of get through a few questions uh, uh, so that you don't have to wait around, and then we can um, go to the, uh, I'll go vote, and then we'll get the next panel in. So if I'm speaking quickly, that's why, okay? Mr. Baer, let me ask you, what leverage does the United States have in promoting greater human rights uh, protections in Indonesia? Uh, what are your top priorities in this area? And in your experience, what institutions or officials can the U.S. influence, and where does our influence fail to have a meaningful impact? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it, it, in order uh, of, of those three uh, points, I mean, I think in terms of leverage, obviously in any bilateral relationship, there are always things that one side wants or the other. But I think the most powerful leverage really in terms of human rights for Indonesia is is the very real desire both within the society and within the government to increasingly uh, take on and embrace the leadership role that they've taken both regionally and internationally in the years to come. And, you know, that's something that is actually uh, very much in the U.S. national interest for them to play uh, a leading role uh, on the global stage and something that they recognize is in their own interest. And the connection between their own uh, domestic uh, political arrangements, uh, the, the peace peaceful, uh, uh, having a peaceful resolution in Papua, et cetera, the connection between that and their ability to step out and, and really be a leader on the, on the world stage, I think, is one that they rightly understand and one that we uh, reinforce in our conversations with them. And so progress on human rights, um, you know, a, a good election uh, next year, et cetera, those are all things that will help contribute to strengthening in Indonesia's image on the world stage. And we continue to, to reinforce that and, and to support it where we can. Um, in terms of priorities, I, you know, the accountability uh, uh, for past violations is something that is always front and center uh, on uh, on our agenda. Uh, underscoring, it really is a cultural shift that needs to take place. Uh, if you uh, talk to people in Indonesia, there there is not the expectation for accountability in response to these um, abuses yet, and that's something that needs to change because accountability is a crucial part of rule of law. And as Indonesia continues to consolidate democratic gains and, and uh, seek to reap the, finan the ongoing economic benefits of them, accountability is, actually, is also very important for making people trust that when people don't play by the rules in other realms, that there will be punishment. And so we will continue to re reinforce that uh, across the board. One other priority that I would say is an emerging one, where we have both good and concern, uh, good stories to tell and concerns. Indonesia co-sponsored a resolution that we uh, supported at the Human Rights Council on Internet Freedom last summer, and that's a good thing. I, I would put them as a they are a important country in that uh, debate about uh, the way that we treat uh, expression and association online, and for that reason, making sure that their domestic laws are consistent with international standards with respect to the internet. Uh, uh, with respect to human rights as they seek to um, to figure out how they'll respond to the Internet and other new technologies is another area of priority. I could go on to several others, but I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. In terms of institutions, I mean, I, I, I think we, we have very strong uh, relations with uh, the executive branch. We're able to work across uh, ministries. Uh, they have uh, several coordinating ministries that work with uh, different areas of work. I've worked closely with... Uh, one of the coordinating ministries on the voluntary principles on security and human rights because we've been encouraging Indonesia to become a member of that, which we think would help them deal with some of the security issues revolving around natural resources, including in Papua. Uh, so I would say we have good relations with both parliamentary, uh, we, we meet with members of parliament, as well as the, uh, the executive branch, and those institutions are important from a governmental side. But again, as I said in my testimony, you know, one of the advantages about working with Indonesia and uh, having discussions on these issues with Indonesia is that there's such a vibrant civil society that is able to make the case for change from within that we, we find ourselves echoing their points uh, rather than having to make them uh, as a chorus of one. So uh, I would say that those institutions are the most important. Let me get you another question before we go to Ms. Sutton. Uh, you know, there's some disp dispute that, uh, that there is a rising tide of religious intolerance in Indonesia. Yet according to the Jakarta-based Satera Institute, which monitors religious freedom in Indonesia, there were 216 cases of violent attacks on religious minorities in 2010, 244 cases in 2011, and 264 cases in 2012. 
Uh, do you agree that there is a rising tide of religious intolerance in Ind Indonesia? And if so, what might be done to reverse it? We're very concerned about the, these, uh, you know, as you said, there are uh, increase in numbers reported, and we're very concerned about uh, any acts of religious intolerance and the apparent increase, in, uh, particularly with respect to the uh, Ahmadiyya, as well as some minority Christian groups, etc. As I mentioned, the closure of, uh, of religious uh, buildings, as well as the violent attacks. Uh, you know, this is a combination, as Susan said, you know, there are deep uh, prejudices and, and societal t tensions, etc. That's not an excuse. It's a background reality. Um, and the government needs to, as, as other governments need to, step up and figure out how to get the right police capacity to protect the rights of all uh, where it is needed. And there are some national level legal reforms that send a signal to people on the ground like the the Ahmadiyya decree about who deserves full protections or not and so making national level legal changes could also send a signal signal of tolerance uh, revising the blasphemy law even if it's intended to prevent religious tensions uh, we've seen around the world and there was a recent study by the Pew Foundation that showed that where laws like the blas like blasphemy laws are in place, societal tensions are actually higher rather than lower. Restrictions on freedom of expression and freedom of religion, whether they're intended to or not, they're often justified on the, the basis of reducing tensions, but the reality is, empirically, we can show that they don't reduce tensions. In fact, it correlates, uh, whether or not it's causal, it correlates uh, to increase societal tensions. So there are a number of steps that they can take, and uh, obviously, as Susan said, the election... Any election is a time when um, there's a risk of passions becoming more heated, uh, and so we will be closely watching this and, and urging the government to do what it can to reduce the number of violent attacks, et cetera, uh, as, as the election approaches. Thank you, Ms. Sutton. Amer America's cooperation with Indonesia has steadily improved, as evidenced by the signing of our comprehensive partnership agreement uh, with Indonesia in November 2010 and our reengagement with uh, Indonesia's security forces in the form of military to military assistance. We also have mutual interest in counterterrorism efforts, disaster response, and regional security. In such a context, how should the United uh, U.S. policymakers balance the inter those interests with the interest of protecting human rights? Well, I really think that... I think you have to... Yeah. yeah okay. To keep it short, I don't think that there's a conflict between those two interests. Um, if the Indonesian security forces don't be, are not seen as protectors of the citizens and not as protectors of a clique of the leadership mm. or protectors of their own interests, they can't do the job they need to do. They can't professionalize. They can't reform. They can't become a responsible force. So I don't think there's a balancing act. Um, reform of the security forces to make them more professional, more accountable, uh, a, a proud, competent, capable, respected force will help us in all the other areas that we want to work in. So, so what can we do to foster greater professionalism and respect for human rights among the, uh, both the Indonesian military and police forces, especially among the Kapasa Special Forces and the Anti-Terror Detachment 88, both of which are, both of which the U.S., uh, I think both of which the U.S. supports, I guess, um, you know, are there conditions that we place on our assistance to these entities sufficient to promote professionalism and respect for human rights? Well, on Kopassus, as, as you, you know, in right. 2010, we announced a very slow, very cautious step-by-step -step approach. And at this point, um, it's still very slow and very cautious. We, we only have occasional visits and subject matter expert exchanges, mm -hmm. which are like conferences. We don't do any training. We don't provide any equipment to Kopassus. And we have a ways to go because of concerns about ensuring that there's a new culture enshrined and that the, the government is doing everything it needs to do to ensure accountability. Um, I think that, you know, people from the government always talk about training and how training has great effect. And, you know, obviously we see that training has a better effect in some places than it has in others. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that the, the contact, the training, I do think that those have an impact. But I think they have to be combined with, a, with a, a very steady emphasis on the principles that we are concerned about. And as you know, we have a very aggressive vetting effort. Um, any 
unit that is going to benefit from U.S. assistance has got to be checked to make sure that it has not in, been involved in human rights abuses. And if they have been, then they go into the penalty box. Mm -hmm. And that is pretty effective. Yeah, and, and, and I'm going to have to go vote, but I, you know, I mean, ultimately, uh, you know, it depends on the political will of the government and the institutions that exist in Indonesia as to whether or not, yeah. you know, some of these, you know, uh, some of these institutions that have had a history of human rights abuses and, uh, you know, terrible activities actually kind of clean up their act. I mean, that's where the accountability right. is, is so important. Um, we may have a few other questions, which I, I'm going to I'm going to submit in writing to you, if that's okay, because I I don't, you know, you've, you've been kind enough. I was late, and you're kind enough to kind of give, give us some great testimony and answer these questions very quickly. Uh, but there are a few more that I that we may have that we might want to submit in writing, um, and um, and that way I can spare you from having to wait and wait <laughs> and wait. So, um, but I I'll just close with this. I. Um, I appreciate what both of you do, and I appreciate your commitment to human rights. And um, you know, and the whole point of this commission is to to raise awareness um, and to you know pressure the administration and others to pay more attention. And um, I don't think you guys need any pressuring, but uh, but it is helpful, I think, for us to discuss these things publicly. And uh, and to, I think to let the Indonesian government know that look, we we appreciate. The relationship that we've established, but we're still, we're still watching uh, on the areas of, in the areas of human rights. So, so with that, I'm going to briefly recess so I can go vote on something that I'm sure is totally meaningless, but nonetheless, I have to vote on it. <laughs> and I will be right back. Thank you.
I guess we're we're ready for the next panel. John Sifton, uh, Asia Advocacy Director for Human Rights Watch. T. Kumar, the Director for International Advocacy, Amnesty International USA. Uh, Sri uh, Supayati, a Deputy Coordinator, Commission for the D Disappeared and Victims of, of Violence. Uh, Octavianos Mo Mote, am I pronouncing that right? A Yale University Law School Fellow and former uh, Compass uh, Journalist. I want to welcome all of you here uh, and look forward to your testimony. I apologize for the vote that came up, but nothing I can do about it. Uh, so this time, Mr. Sifton, why don't we begin with you and uh, welcome. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to thank you and your staff for inviting me to testify today and, and thank the committee at large for focusing on Indonesia's rights record which sadly all too often doesn't receive the attention it deserves. Um, I've provided a longer version of my testimony to the committee and it's been placed on Human Rights Watch's website, but I'm gonna limit myself to discussing only one of these issues in detail, um, the issue of the persecution of religious minorities. But first, I do wanna acknowledge some of the points raised by the um, State Department colleagues who preceded us, as well as speak directly to any officials from the Indonesian government who may be here today. And what I want to say is that it is decidedly not in dispute that Indonesia has seen enormous changes over this 15-year period um, that we've been referring to. Human Rights Watch, of course, is aware of the general and widespread improvements that have occurred with respect to civil and political rights, and particularly civil society and media, and as well as the major improvements in social and economic spheres and health and education indicators. But the human rights situation of Indonesia cannot continue to be gauged in comparison with the country's past. Genuine reform should be recognized, but the Indonesian government should be judged by the same set of standards as any other government and criticized objectively for failing to meet those obligations. To do, others, to do otherwise would really be to condemn the people of Indonesia to a lowered standard of rights protections, and that is not appropriate. The written version of my testimony focuses on four particular areas of concern. First, the situation in Papua and related issues of freedom of expression. And second, the issue of military impunity for rights abuses. Third, the worsening persecution of religious minorities. And last, an issue that often doesn't get a lot of attention but is quite disturbing, the issues involving migrants and asylum seekers, about which we are about to put out a report this summer. I can't discuss all these issues now. But they are in the written uh, testimony. Um, but I am going to say a few quick things about Papua, the Indonesian military rights record, and, about, um, and then turn to the religious minorities issue. As far as Papua goes, I, I have to say Human Rights Watch remains very concerned. Uh, the area continues to be under quasi-military occupation. Military and police forces exercise extensive control over the ethnic pop Papuan population. Um, you know, other witnesses are going to speak about this, um, but I think it's, it's an issue of, of very serious concern. A lot of the um, problematic incidents that have occurred over the last few years are reviewed in our written testimony and. Um, Mr. Baer referred to them uh, as well. I just want to mention that just a few weeks ago, this last May 1st, which was the 50th anniversary of the day when Papuan territory was ceded to Indonesia by the United Nations in 1963, uh, there, were, there were public events to commemorate and protest that date, and things did not go well. On the day before the planned protests, Indonesian police reportedly shot and killed two Papuan protesters in the city of Sarong. And on the day itself, at least 20 protesters were arrested in Bayak and Tamika, uh, not for violently protesting. Many of the persons arrested were detained only for raising the pro-independence Morning Star flag. That was the act for which they were arrested. Um, so yet again, we see how Indonesia punishes subjects for exercising their right that they possess under international human rights law, the right to peacefully protest and engage in free expression. Um, I also note briefly in my testimony the ongoing case of Philip Karma, 
longtime Papuan activist who has been in prison since 2004 for advocating peacefully for Papua's independence from Indonesia. And I assume some of my co-panelists will discuss that case in more detail. I would only note that Karma has been in prison for almost a decade now. He was arrested in 2004, again, at a protest at which the Morning Star flag was raised. Um, he was sentenced to 15 years in prison. Philip Karma is a political prisoner or as my colleagues at Amnesty International would say, a prisoner of conscience. Um, and I would note that no allegations of violence have ever been made against karma. He has, he has spoken extensively against the use of violence. Uh, he said at one point, we want to engage in a dignified dialogue with the Indonesian government, a dialogue between two peoples with dignity, and dignity means we have no use of violence. Um, on military impunity, and I was going to talk about this in a little bit more detail, but I have to note that my State Department colleagues uh, were offered an unvarnished criticism. Indonesia continues to have a very, very serious record with military impunity. It's not in, in dispute. Um, the rights record overall may have improved, but the fact is when members of the Indonesian military are engaged in human rights abuses, um, they are almost never punished. And events just this last April or March, rather, um, are going to be a big test as to whether that's still true. And frankly, things are not looking good. Uh, I speak about in my testimony the events of late March and April when a set of Kapasis soldiers, um, angry that one of their colleagues had been killed in a bar fight, broke into a prison where the four gentlemen who had killed their colleague allegedly um, were being held and executed them. And just ex they, they beat up the police and found the four men who had allegedly killed their colleague, and they, and they executed them. And on the way out, they took the video uh, surveillance camera tapes. Um, whether these folks get held accountable will, will as, as Mr. Baer said, be a key test of the impunity question. So on re freedom of religion, where I'll end, uh, Human Rights Watch has published an extensive report on this subject that was issued earlier this year. And the report, I have a few copies over there. It's on our website. It, it describes what is unambiguously a worsening environment for religious minorities across Indonesia. And as the report notes, Islamist militants are increasingly, increasingly mobilizing in mobs to attack religious minorities with almost complete impunity. Um, in addition to that, you have all the uh, harassment and what, what would call administrative um, inconveniences that are that the state itself um, and local governments uh, impose on Christian groups and Shia groups. Um, at, the, at, the, at the end of the day, what we need to do is identify exactly what's going wrong here. And the, the fact of the matter is that there are senior government officials, including the religious affairs minister and the home minister who have continued to justify the restrictions on religious freedom um, that are being imposed on minorities and who continue to say things and do things that suggest that they simply don't care when radical mobs um, attack minorities. The religious affairs minister in particular has himself inflamed tensions by making highly discriminatory remarks about Ahmadiyya and Shia religious communities, suggesting in public that both are heretical faiths. Um, I would be glad to answer more questions about our report, about the worsening attacks, but I, I really um, think the, the record speaks for itself, our report speaks for itself, and the numbers from the Satara Institute speak for themselves. So there really shouldn't be any dispute about the subject that you asked my State Department colleagues about, whether the situation is getting worse or not. Um, I speak with the State Department regularly. My colleagues speak with the embassy in Jakarta regularly. And I know that they know that the situation is getting worse. The only question is whether the US government, um, or the State Department in particular, is willing to admit that fact publicly. And they may have other reasons to not say so publicly. But I know, again, I know that they know that the situation is getting worse. So with that, you know, I will, um, I will leave it there and be glad to answer questions after my co-panelists testify. Thank you very much, Mr. Kumar. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Amnesty International is grateful that you are holding this hearing. 
we are grateful because U.S. relationship uh, with Indonesia is very strong. But in that relationship, human rights is missing in a meaningful manner. I mean, there are statements that is reflected in the comprehensive partnership agreement that U.S. signed. They mentioned human rights, but the real actions are missing there. So having said that, I would like to go through main concerns, which my colleague from Human Rights Watch mentioned, to emphasize the deteriorating situation there. Fifteen years have passed from a dictatorship to a democracy. But when you compare 15 years, the abuses are not lessening. It's increasing in, in different sectors. Latest one, of course, the religious freedom issues. Uh, our State Department colleagues, uh, Dan Bea mentioned uh, an active civil society, vibrant civil society. That's a term he used. Yes, there is vibrant civil society. They are human rights defenders. But what they face is something he missed to mention here. They have been abused, tortured, imprisoned. Criminal defamation cases have been filed. This is under democracy, by the way. This, we are not talking about Suharto. And to cap it all, a famous and important human rights defender called Munir was poisoned and killed on his flight. He was on a flight to, to Holland. And so far, no meaningful steps have been taken. The President Giuliano basically asked for a report, and he did not make public the report about what happened, who is responsible. These are, there are suspicions that there are senior officials who are involved in these killings. This is the plight of human rights defenders there. So I do, we would urge Congress take this as a priority and urge President Giuliano, he's going to be in, in the U.S. I don't know whether he's coming here. He's going to be in the U.S. to receive an award in New York soon to release that report. That's all. Why are you holding it? That's the most important thing. So we will urge you to act on that. So human rights defenders still facing abuses. Second is there are over 70 to 80 political prisoners there. These are nonviolent, peaceful protesters, which we call it uh, prisoners of conscience. Philip Kama from Papua is one. There are other people in Maluku and other some religious-related uh, prisoners. You can ask for their release. It's simple. I know you have a project going on. Amnesty is part of it. And it will be great. It will be great if you can keep the pressure on these 70 prisoners. The danger we are seeing is there is going to be an election next year. We don't know who is going to win. Uh, we don't want to guess. The current president, whatever said and done, is having a very good relationship with President Obama and the administration. And also, he doesn't have any black spots, even though he was a former military general. No black spots. So he can do it. So this one year is extremely crucial to get these 70 people out and also to, uh, to, to bring the report out on this Munir, what happened to him, how he was killed in the plane and all the rest of it. Third one is the security forces. What we are seeing today is nothing different what happened. It, uh, the difference may be a little lesser now, what happened under dictatorship. No one has been held accountable in a meaningful way. There are people, officers in a lower rank who, who may have been held accountable. We are talking from starting from 1966, when half a million to one million so-called communists were killed. No one was held accountable. East Timor massacre, no one was held accountable. Ache killing, no one was held accountable in a meaningful manner. Then 98 democracy uprising, 13 students disappeared by the COPASAS, the special forces. No one has been held accountable. And currently in Papua and other places, they are going on rampage. I mean, things they can kill and get away from murder. And the latest one is what happened in the prison. They were able to get into the prison, execute them, 
and they have arrested 11 people. Let's see what's happening. Let's the administration, U.S. administration, hold these people accountable for these abuses. The other one is the Detachment 88, which was mentioned earlier. This is a special police unit that was created after the Bali bombing uh, to counter uh, extremist forces. And this Detachment 88 was trained, more or less advised by the U.S., so they own, they own. I mean, U.S. have a lot of responsibility for their behavior. This detachment 88, not only going after so-called extremists, they are also going after nonviolent political demonstrators in Papua, Malukus, and other places. We have seen this over and over again. So U.S. can ask to stop these things because U.S. created this, uh, this unit. So on that note, we will urge U.S. Congress to urge U.S. administration to make sure that Detachment 88 does not abuse human rights. They were given a task for something else, but they are doing something else there. So in a, in a nutshell, this hearing is bringing important issues to the forefront. The timing is perfect because of the upcoming elections. And there are specific things that Congress can do to push directly the administration as well as directly uh, President Yudhiyana. Thank you very much for inviting him, Mr. Thank you very much for your testimony. And uh, we'll now uh, turn to uh, Ms. Uh, Supriyati. Um, welcome. Uh, you need to press the... Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak here today. I would also like to FIDH, the Federation, the International Federation for Human Rights, for beaming me to Washington from Jakarta. During the Suharto era, the Indonesian military and police committed many grave violations. The current government, led by President Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono, has refused to investigate, prosecute, or provide reparation to victims for past violations, or to put into place regulation that would stop abuses from happening in the future. I would like to highlight two emblematic cases of ongoing impunity within the Indonesian Armed Forces, the unsolved murder of Contrast founder and the human rights activist Munir Said Talib, the, and the enforced disappearances that took place between 1997 and 1998. Munir Said Talib was murdered on September 7, 2004 on a Garuda Airlines flight from Jakarta to Amsterdam. In 2005, President SBY ordered an investigation into his murder, but the report from this investigation was never released. On November 9, 2005, the members of the U.S. House of Representatives sent a letter to President SBY, urging him to release the report and act on its recommendation. At the time, the letter was, was widely reported in the press and helped draw international attention to the Indonesian government's failure to act. As a result, the Indonesian police opened an investigation and a former Garuda pilot was convicted of the murder and sentenced to 20 years in prison. However, contrast on research on this case leads us to believe that the convicted pilot was only a hired assassin and that the people who plotted Munir's murder are still at large. Between 1997 and 1998, 13 pro-democracy activists was disappeared, never to be heard from again. In 2009, the Indonesian House representative issued official recommendation to President SBY on this case. The recommendation included creating an ad hoc human rights tribunal, initiating an independent investigation into the whereabouts of the disappeared, providing, providing reparation to the families of the disappeared, and ratifying the UN Convention on the Protection of All Persons from Enforced Disappearances. Although the ratification of the Convention e part is part of the Indonesian National Action Plan on Human Rights, to this day the government has failed to actually full, fulfill any of the recommendation put forth by the Indonesian Human Rights Commission. In addition, the person who is widely believed to be res responsible for these disappearances and many other gross human rights violations, former Special Forces Commander Prabowo Subianto is now a front runner for the upcoming presidential election in 2014. These are only two examples of the pervasive impunity for human rights violation in Indonesia. 
This is especially troubling within the Indonesian military. As a soldier, accused of human rights violation are currently tried in military courts, even in instances when the crimes are perpetrated against civilians. This has resulted in many perpetrators of gross human rights violation receiving extremely lenient sentences. For example, the nine soldiers found guilty of torture and killing 17-year-old Charles Mali receive only a one-year prison sentence from the military tribunal. In addition to their lenient and arbitrary sentencing, military tribunals are often not transparent and do not meet international standards. The widespread impunity for past human rights violation has created a climate where state security forces are not deterred from committing more abuses, and the military and police continue to commit human rights violation on a daily basis. In 2012, Contrast documented at least 704 human rights violations committed by the police and 94 violations committed by the military. This including shootings, torture, arbitrary arrest, and detention, among others. In a particularly shocking case, in March 2013, members of military special forces raided a central Java prison and killed four prisoners who were waiting a trial. Eleven soldiers now facing a charge in military court for this attack, but based on the track record of military tribunals in Indonesia, there is a strong reason to believe the perpetrators will get off the minimal sentences or possibly even acquittals. The cycle of unchecked violence is made worse by the failure of Indonesia laws and criminal code to reinforce accountability for human rights violations. For example, the president recently passed a law on internal and public security which gives the military authority to intervene in situations that threaten public order. The ambiguity of this law can could provide the military with authority to suppress dissent and freedom of expression in the name of security and public order. In addition, the Indonesian Criminal Code does not articulate torture as specific crime. Torture continues to be common during arrest and detention, and, were, and the perpetrators are never held to account. In light of these ongoing abuses and lack of justice for victims, we believe it is in the best interest of the United States to be careful in its relationship with Indonesia, to avoid supporting a military and police force that are guilty of gross human rights violation. Moreover, it is a moral responsibility of the United States to use its influence over Indonesia to push for greater accountability and respect for international law. We call on the U.S. government to insist the President SBY exercise leadership in addressing past human rights abuses committed by Indonesian security forces and preventing future violence by releasing the 2005 report on Munir Said Talib's death and acting on the recommendation therein, implementing the recommendation of the Indonesia Parliament regarding the enforced disappearances in 1997-1998, condemning ongoing violence by the Indonesia military and police against civilians, and reforming the policies of this state institution to ensure that perpetrators of many future acts of violence are held accountability in civilians' court. Reform Indonesia Criminal Court to reflect international human rights norms and laws by example criminalizing the use of torture and limiting military involvement in question of internal security. If the Indonesian government fails to provide this protection and the Indonesian military and police continue to commit human rights abuses, the U.S. Congress must insist on terminating any funding for Indonesia armed forces. This is not unprecedented. The U.S. Congress enacted a ban on military funding for Indonesia from 1992 to 1995 in response to human rights violations by Indonesian military in East Timor. However, despite ongoing violation and impunity, Indonesia has received hundreds of millions of dollars in military assistance from the U.S. since Obama came into office. In September 2012, Obama proposed another $1.4 billion arm package for Indonesia. Until the Indonesian government can stop gross human rights violation and hold military leadership accountable, the U.S. will terminate the support to the, milita to the Indonesian armed forces. Thank you again for your attention. Very important issue. Thank you very much, and um, I want to say, Mr. Mote, I, I mispronounced your name in the very beginning, and I want to apologize uh, for that, but um, we are glad to have you here, and you're our final witness. Please proceed. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and um, I'm very pleased to be here because uh, today West Papuans uh, commemorate 50 years of Indonesian occupation. If we talk about... Uh, 15 years of change in Indonesia, in West Papua, um, we are experiencing there is no change in 50 years of Indonesian colonization. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, today West Papuan's people, all uh, who are in West Papua, as well as in, in uh, exile, people watching this uh, testimony, uh, 
and because and this is very historic because uh, 50 years after U.S. government help uh, to put us uh, being part of Indonesia, and in this moment, uh, I will not describe the facts and figures of the human rights situation for the two reasons. Uh, First, the situation has been regularly detailed in both uh, by government reports, such as uh, those from State Department, and particularly because from the Human Rights Watch and Amnesty, uh, as well as many other uh, international human rights detail uh, about human rights violation in West Papua. Uh, but I uh, detailed uh, some of the issues in my written uh, statement. And second, most importantly, uh, why I didn't talk about the fact and figure is because we should pay more attention to take action in a finding a solution for the half-century unresolved conflict in the Pacific. In the current geographical context in Asia and the Pacific, which has been marked by heightening the regional conflict in South China Sea and Korean Peninsula, we cannot afford to overlook es escalating conflict in West Papua and other parts in the Pacific. Uh, the urgency of the act stems from the UN principle of the responsibility to, to protect, which the U.S. and all United Nations members are unanimously endorse. In the case of West Papua, there are a number of promising signs that international support can pave the way toward concrete steps uh, toward a peaceful solution under R2P. In early 2002, the President of Indonesia, Mr. Yudhoyono, publicly expressed his willingness to engage in serious dialogue with Papuans during the audience with Papuans' church leader. He expressed this twice in separate occasions, suggesting that he was uh, committed to ending conflict in Papua once and for all. However, it has been a year now and only left a couple of months, and we have not heard any follow-up to this commitment. Instead, Indonesian police and military operations in Papua have in intensified and the security forces continue to commit the crimes against humanity. On the West Papuan side, we have embarked on a peace initiative initially agreed during our Congress in 2000 in Jayapura, the capital city of West Papua, uh, Papua province. We ex explicitly, exp explicitly unanimously endorsed using only peaceful means in a struggle for our rights. Since then, various elements of the Papuan community have engaged in peace campaign, including church leaders, political leaders, students' movement, women's group, and even Papuan's freedom fighters. In another word, the pursuit of a peaceful solution to the seemingly intractable conflict in West Papua is more than desirable. It is rooted to our deep conviction. This belief has become f fountain of our struggle for the peace. Uh, I in elaborate the, uh, more details about how the peace pre preparation that led by Catholic priest Father Nellis uh, and but there is no progress at all from uh, uh, President uh, Yudhoyono uh, about whether or not he will continue to dialogue with West Papua. And he appointed a special repertoire, uh, Dr. Farid Hussein. He already uh, reported uh, nine times, but there is uh, no response back from the uh, Indonesian uh, presidents. Uh, despite of uh, providing a third of Indonesian national income, the West Papuan provinces uh, the central government provides very minimal public service to Papuans. The latest report of Indonesia Bureau of Statistics ranked Papua at the bottom of the Indonesian National Human Development Index uh, during 15 years, uh, from 1996-2011. Papuans are the bottom of the country in average years of schooling, life expectancy, and per, and per, uh, and per capita income. This fact poses a serious question of the effectiveness of the 2002 special autonomy in addressing the basic needs of the Papuans. That is why 
Papuans symbolically returned special autonomy packets to central government during a massive rally in 2010. And this failure of the spatial autonomy is also recognized by Indonesian leaders, such as the governor of Yogyakarta, and he said that the relation between Jakarta and Papua is exactly as relation in colonial time between Jakarta and uh, Western uh, uh, many islands outside of Indonesia. The high level of a state violence together with impunity and denials as well as a minimal level of public service have put West Papua as a nation at the risk of extin extinction. As described by Yuan Mendes, the former special advisor to UN Secretary General on Genocide Prevention. An analysis by the Allard K. Lowenstein International Human Rights Clinic Yellow School in 2002 had suggested that possibility of a genocide occurring in West Papua. In similar vein, uh, James L. Smith, an Australian researcher from the Center for Peace and Conflict Studies at the University of Sydney, concluded that the demographic shift in Papua has marginalized indigenous Melanesian Papuans in their own land. And James Elsmany, using very conservative uh, data, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, and he came up to the conclusion that in 2020, which is uh, seven years from now, Melanesian West Papuans only be 28.99% in our land. So this is exactly, this is, uh, he was not using the, uh, the uh, influx of population and special autonomy that raised about 5%. He was only using a very conservative data. So I believe that uh, this 28% in five, uh, seven years will be faster than that seven years. Um, I elaborate a couple of uh, academic facts, but I don't, I don't read that, uh, to just to give uh, how important the, the negotiation. So, um, therefore, um, I would like to only, the studies that I w was uh, intend to read, uh, give us a good ground to argue that in long run, non-violence violence resistance in Papua, particularly the call for peace dialogue, is more likely to succeed than violence resistance, which is we all believe. It is a matter of time, but as these studies reveal, the international community must play a significant role as a catalyst of peace process. Now is the time for U.S. Congress, and which is I really uh, believe we, with your chairmanship and your champion on human rights uh, to act and endorse Papua Peace Initiative. We cannot afford to sacrifice more lives for solvable uh, conflict like in Papua. In 2010, the House uh, Subcommittee on Asia uh, and the Pacific held the first ever congressional hearing on West Papua. The hearing was organized by Congressman Eni Falamea Fahenga to examine uh, Indonesia deliberately and systematically abused in, uh, in power. I, I take this example where when the congressman of the organized this, the response in Indonesian media was saying only a couple of a member of uh, uh, congressmen uh, or congresswomen were there. So Indonesian government uh, ignored, no worry, you know, only few of them are there. So I believe same things will happen, congressman, um, if if when they see you, the only one lead here. Well, let me just let me assure anybody who has any questions about that that uh, there are many members of the Human Rights Commission, uh, and that um, you know uh, we, there are multiple hearings going on all at once. But uh, I don't want anyone to be deceived that because I'm the only one here today that that means I'm the only one who cares. That would be the wrong. Uh, impression to get. There are a lot. There are there are very many concerns about human rights uh, uh, in this Congress, and um, so I want to I want to be clear. This is a bipartisan uh, concern, and um, you know I and there will be actions that come out of this hearing that will be bipartisan. So I thank you for. Th thank you for uh, this, uh, and I would like to conclude my uh, testimony with this. 
that this is the time to act without any further delay. This is the time for the Congress to act to uh, prevent another mass slaughter of indigenous uh, Papuans using sovereignty as a license. This is very important because Obama said that uh, we cannot allow the sovereignty as a license to slaughter your own people. This is what Indonesian government did in West Papua. Since uh, the Occupy West Papua, uh, West Papua always closed uh, and nobody is uh, allowed to visit West Papua. Even our U.S. ambassador uh, once uh, forbid to visit West Papua. Uh, I think also it is our moral responsibility because John F. Kennedy administration was deeply involved in incorporating West Papua into Indonesia. Secondly, because U.S. Uh, State Department is very well informed about what's going on in West Papua. And finally, uh, I think uh, this, is, this is our moral responsibility as human being. Therefore, I would like to ask uh, Mr. Congressman uh, to pass a U.S. Congressional resolution arguing the U.S. government to exercise its responsibility to protect in order to end crime against humanity, against U.S. Papuan's people. Second, the same resolution should argue the Indonesian government to begin good faith negotiation with Papuan's peace team with the mediation by international party. The third, to support the Papuan's peace team with the logistic and research support through U.S.-based research think tank institute in order to develop its capacity to represent Papua as a peace negotiator. Four, to re request the U.S. administration to provide moral, political, and necessary logistic support to the U Udo Yono administration to initiate peace negotiation with Papua peace team. And lastly, to condition U.S. security assistance to Indonesia on ending human rights violation in West Papua and whether the Indonesian government is negotiating in a good faith with the people of West Papua. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Mote, and I want to thank all of you for, for being here. Uh, and I want to thank you for what you do uh, on behalf of human rights um, for people in Indonesia. And um, I will, uh, and I, it's important that you're here and it's important that we're having this hearing because there are lots of things happening in, in this country and around the world. Uh, and your being here makes it uh, impossible for people not to reflect on what's hap happening in Indonesia. So it's important that you're here. Um, and um, you know, among the things that I, I, I think some assignments that this commission can take on is, uh, I think we can adopt as, uh, uh, Philippe Karma as a prisoner of conscience. We ought to be proud of our effort, uh, which we can do. Um, uh, we need, uh, could anyone explain to me why the, uh, the, the report by the fact-finding group on Munir's death was not made public? Is there, a, is there a reason or is it just not being made public? <laughs> it's, a, it's a political, it may be that there may be names which uh, may be higher-ups in the intelligence community and the security community that president is not willing to take the political stand. But you want to say something? Sorry. Uh, as far as we know that uh, there is no uh, willing, the good willing coming from the our president, SBY, to release the report because uh, we are uh, concerned and we are uh, ensure that the uh, uh, under the report, there are recommendations that it, that it is uh, relation with the intelligence body, that uh, at the time the intelligence body is, the, is a part of the involvement party to uh, responsible for the murder of Munir. Uh, yeah, I think it's important to probably opine for a moment on why Munir was killed. Mm -hmm. He was killed in all likelihood because he had information about the Indonesian intelligence services abuses in 1998 in particular, but also just generally. And any report that really gets into the circumstances of his death will reveal that the highest levels of the Indonesian intelligence service were complicit. Not just one rogue member, which is a theory that's been floated around, a rogue member of the, of the intelligence service killing him because of a particular incident that he was implicated in by Munir, 
but rather that the, at the highest levels of the intelligence service, he you know was responsible. But there's no law, there's no restriction that says the government can't release the report if it wanted to. It's it's a political. It's a political. Purely political. So maybe one of the things that we can also do here is put pressure on the government to to release that yes. report because uh, that it, and look, uh, you know. The road to reform requires transparency and a little sunshine, uh, and sometimes it's not always comfortable, um, you know. Uh, but it is essential if you're going to change things. Uh, if you look the other way, you know, when crimes are committed and human rights abuses occur, chances are that they will continue to occur. You I know, know and, and and the high profile of this case. I mean, just to give you a sense, imagine if the CIA had had my boss, the director of Human Rights Watch, killed. Can you imagine yeah. such a thing? I mean, that's, that's essentially the situation that trees in, analogous in Indonesia. Well, well, one of the ways our institutions here in the United States evolved and were reformed were in, in, in part because of uh, congressional hearings and fact-finding you know, um, initiatives that help kind of reveal some of the problems within the system, which then had to be corrected. So that's a, that's a, a, so I think we can, I think we can, you know, make an effort to try to uh, urge the Indonesian government to allow there to be some sunshine and some transparency on this. And I, I we have limited time. I, I guess I have some questions here, which I'm going to kind of go through and um, appreciate your answers. Mr. Sifton, uh, you know, we've seen that the, Indone that in the Indonesia government at the national and local levels has repeatedly failed to protect religious minorities from abuse. And, you know, so what, what has to be done to improve law enforcement, uh, deterrent measure, measures and prosecutions? Uh, is there more the central government can be doing to protect religious minorities? And just one other, I'm going to throw a whole bunch of things at you at once because um, you note in your written testimony that military personnel cannot be tried in civilian courts, with few exceptions, and that the military justice system has a very p poor prosecutorial record. Can you expand on the shortcomings of Indonesia's military justice system, and how should the United States, how should the U.S. leverage its improved military-to-military -military relationship with Indonesia to address some of these shortcomings? Okay. Well, on the religious side, there's a huge amount that the national government could do, both using their bully pulpit, although that's probably the wrong term, but um, using, you know, their megaphone. rhetoric, their megaphone, yeah. <laughs> as well as particular things that the religious affairs ministry could do. The problem is that the president has made a political decision to allow his religious affairs minister to be who he is. He is a radical a Sunni extremist, um, and he's a political actor. Uh, and for political reasons, he's been put where he is. And until the president of Indonesia becomes brave enough to deal with that political baggage that he brings by allowing this religious affairs minister to be in his post, it's hard to see um, any changes being made. But what should happen, which I doubt will happen, is that he should get rid of his religious mm -hmm. affairs minister and, and replace him with somebody who is more willing to address these problems. Um, one good thing that Kumar mentioned was that the president is on, is on his way to New York to be given an award by a, uh, an organization in New York called the Appeal of Conscience, which is run by a rabbi named Arthur Schneer. We've written to them, Appeal of Conscience, to ask that reward be rescinded and that the invitation be rescinded, but it would be helpful if members of the New York congressional delegation contacted Rabbi Schneer himself. And how do you qualify for that award? Well, it's, it's an appeal of conscience as a religious tolerance organization. Oh. It's supposed to ostensibly be economical and promote oh. religious tolerance. As I've said, you know, it's, it, it, SBY is not a, a fitting recipient of this award by any stretch of the imagination, and that's why the award oh. should be. And this has become quite, it's on the front page of all the, of the Jakarta newspapers. It's now filtered into... Um, newspapers in Israel, as well as the Jewish Daily Forward and Tablet. I mean, it's become a scandal, and I think it would be appropriate for Rabbi Schneer to rescind, rescind the reward. Um, but anyway, that draws attention to it, but whether the president of Indonesia can actually grow the spinal fortitude to address this, I don't know. But he could do a lot of things. He could appeal uh, decrees against Shia and Ahmadiyya. There are a lot of things he could do, and we lay that out in our report. 
but it's a political question whether he'll do that. On the military side, the pivot to Asia means a lot more military to military engagement. There's no doubt about it. Um, but the president has asked for more military sales. He wants Apaches. He's just done a deal to get German tanks that the German parliament, after huge amounts of negotiation, uh, passed. Now, why Indonesia needs leopard tanks from Germany, I'm not exactly sure uh, why they need tanks at all militarily. But the president of Indonesia has a dream that the Indonesian military will be as powerful as Australia's. Um, I don't know why he wants to do that, but for whatever it's worth, it, it is an opportunity. If the Pentagon's going to be requested for assistance, um, it's going to give them leverage, and they can give advice on impunity. They can say, you need to change your military justice system. It is too um, dependent on... Well, there are a lot of problems with the military justice system, um, from the fact that soldiers cannot be held accountable by civilian authorities, but also the actual military code is very problematic. Here in the United States, there's a memorandum of understanding between the Department of Justice and the, Minister and the Department of Defense, so that it's very easy to just transfer the cases over when it's appropriate, and they have been mm -hmm. um, in many cases. Generally, our rule of thumb at Human Rights Watch is if civilians are killed, it's probably best to have a civilian prosecution as opposed to military court martial. Military court martials should be for disciplinary issues and, 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 and crimes within the military, not for right. dealing with atrocities or human rights abuses. And, and I think the U.S. can push that on them. They can also push issues in Papua, such as giving them advice and saying, listen, from a counterinsurgency point of view, not, you know, notwithstanding the point of view of independence and all that, just because they really get upset when you raise independence. They say, don't mess with our sovereignty and, and all that. But you can say, look, even from a counterinsurgency point of view, you are aggravating this, the situation. It is clear now that there are young Papuans who are at risk of abandoning the nonviolent methods that they've embraced because they're frustrated mm -hmm. by you know, the continuing abuses. You can say, look, if you really want to do good in this situation, you need to get the military out of there. You need to get the Indonesian military out of Papua mm -hmm. and start transferring to a civilian law enforcement model. So those are the things that can be done. There's a huge amount of leverage. But anyway, what the... Congress could do, which would be a great step forward, is to get from the Pentagon by a letter, maybe from HVAC or from Lantos or from appropriations committees, a full accounting of the assistance, not just IMET and FMF, but the NDAA 1206 assistance that might be going through the export control licensing. Just get it in one place, everything that the U.S. military is giving to Indonesia. Well, I think we, so can, we, can, request, we can request that. Uh, you, did you want to add something, Ms. Sparrow? Yes, Sparrow? I just want to add uh, regarding the freedom religion. Actually, the, we have a law. Uh, we have a law to intervene the local government regulation uh, passed, like to uh, prohibit it for minorities groups. Uh, this is under the Ministry of, of Home of Affairs. But then uh, our government, I mean, uh, the Ministry of uh, Home Affairs doesn't want to uh, take action and doesn't want to intervene because uh, he thinking that that is the uh, local government authority, so he doesn't want to take responsible. And the secondly, regarding the military court, actually the two years uh, later, there is a uh effort uh, to revise the, 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 the law on uh, military court. But now the, the effort is uh, now is still stuck because uh, there is a negotiation between, between Parliament and Ministry of Defense regarding the, uh, regarding the, uh, the, minister, the, minister, the minister of Defense is still doesn't want to, uh, doesn't want to release uh, their member to, uh, to, to, to bring to the civilian court. Well, while I have you here, let me ask you a question. What particular challenges do, do human rights defenders uh, like you um, and your colleagues at Contras continue to face in Indonesia today, and what must be done to ensure that you and your colleagues can operate freely and effectively? Uh, actually, the challenges is uh, uh, like to assist for the victims, especially in under the religion, re uh, religion issues. Uh, we are assistant for the victims. Sometimes uh, they, uh, sometimes they are uh, challenges to uh, intimidation and threatening to the victims and also to the assistant, like uh, like uh, NGOs. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is the, under the issue of military military abuses. This is also very sensitive problem in Indonesia. So sometimes uh, we facing the intimidation and threatening for the issue if we uh, provide the legal document or provide the assistant for the victims. Mr. Kumar. It seems 
that one of the trade-offs for removing the Indonesian military from the country's uh, domestic political affairs has been a widespread lack of accountability for past abuses, and you've talked about that. How does impunity for past human rights violations, including the widespread uh, abuses that uh, occurred in Aceh in the 1990s, affect the protection of human rights in Indonesia today? The point is that you give green light to military officers, current and future, that you can do anything and no one is going to hold you accountable. That's the danger that we are seeing. That's what it's reflected in the break, breaking into the prison and killing four so, officers. So how, how do you assess the state of Indonesia's judici judiciary today and its ability to enforce laws protecting the rights of in, Indonesia with the country? Is there anything the United States can do to help strengthen? Yeah, the strengthening uh, rule of law issue. It, uh, the, there are rule of law. There are two aspects to it. It's a regular criminal law, civil issues. That needs to be improved, but that's moving in the right direction. The other one is politically sensitive cases. If there are any politically sensitive cases coming down, how is the judiciary going to deal with that? That's where we see a lot of defects. Uh, for example, the Munir case, even, even the attack on Shias, the judiciary is not stepping in. The police is not stepping in. It's law enforcement. The one issue on the religious freedom, which you asked earlier, uh, the the current wave of attack on religious minorities started after March 2008, uh, 2008 yeah, when the joint ministerial uh, resolution or some kind of, a, of a directive was given that Ahmadiyya community should not uh, propagate or do other activities uh, in their religion. That gave the green light. Basically, they singled out Ahmadiyya community. In other countries, like Pakistan, they said it's, uh, it's, they are not Muslims. Here, they didn't go that far. But they have gone far as saying, you can't. You should stop doing these things. The minute the ministerial level directive came down, general public and others have taken it as a green light and started attacking. That's what That decree should be presented or some some form of explanation should be given. On the issue of um, past human rights abuses, we did not see any senior officials ever being brought. And there is a danger, some may even become popular in the future. I don't want to name names. It was named earlier uh, in the next uh, presidential elections. That's why this one year is extremely crucial. Because if we miss this one year timetable, it will be very difficult to see any whether the U.S. will have any meaningful improvement or relationship with the president or even the willingness from the other end to have any meaningful improvements. Detachment 28, as, I mean 88, as I mentioned, that's extremely important that U.S. should ask for accountability. Mm -hmm. The religious freedom and most importantly, Munir uh, uh, report should be brought. Right. It's not Munir report should be out. Yeah. Because we we are not talking about prosecution. We just want to know what is what's the report is. Right. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Mote, I'm particularly concerned about threats that Indonesia's security forces pose to those in West uh, Papua uh, who are not involved in separatist activities. So what effect does the presence of Kopasa Special Forces and Detachment 88 have on the uh, lives of ordinary citizens, and what should the United States be doing to promote the safety and well-being of those people? Uh, you hit your mic, yeah. Uh, these two uh, units, the Special Forces and the Detachment 88, their act is in the ground is uh, equally the same. Uh, and what we, uh, I think, said the only way really to uh, change the attitudes. I think this is a very important also for for U.S. policy. Uh, we have to uh, change the mindset here in Washington, D.C., uh, that we always think that by assisting the military is using as a way to ask them to change. Uh, the reality in the historical uh, fact is that the only time in, uh, a military is learning is when uh, President Clinton got the military assistance. Right. That's the only time when there's a really serious lesson that uh, Indonesian military. So for me, I think that I don't believe the way uh, the policy we deal 
just cut the relation and ask them or put the condition in a, any uh, assistance. And I think this is a, a very important because the, it is not about the number uh, of the whatever training. This is about political recognition mm -hmm. about the brutalities. Mm -hmm. yeah, tra I mean, I agree. Training in and of itself does not result in institutional reform. No. no. You know, I mean, it is, there needs to be the political will within a country to push that reform forward. So I can train all the soldiers that you send me, but if they go back to an institution that is essentially corrupt or is essentially involved in, in, th in human rights violations with impunity, nothing really changed. So, there, so I think things have to change. Let me, I know we're running out of time here, but let me, let me just ask, let me just kind of conclude and get anybody, anyone who wants to respond to this can't. I mean, look, you know, rela as relations between our country and Indonesia continue to improve, you know, the, you know, the question is how, does, how can we in the United States better leverage its aid strategy especially to its military to military assistance to promote greater respect for human rights in Indonesia. You've given me some examples here, but, uh, you know, um, and I think, I think I've learned that we have a few, some assignments that we can do, you know, in terms of adopting a prisoner of conscience, in terms of asking for a report to be released, in terms of asking our own government what, what, what actually is our, uh, you know, our assistance uh, to Indonesia. Those are things I think we can do here. And we'll work with you um, on you know, making sure we're, 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 you know, we're making the request appropriately. But beyond that, I mean, you know, how do we, you know, um, how do we keep human rights in the forefront? And you know, and and you know, where is our best leverage to be able to, to make a difference? And especially given the fact that this year, as you're saying, Mr. Corey, is a very important year. Yeah, a couple of things yeah. uh, other than what we mentioned earlier is that. Um, Assistant Secretary, uh, sorry, Deputy Secretary Dan Baer said uh, some senior official is in Indonesia or was there recently. Wendy Sherman. Wendy Sherman. We don't see any meaningful statements or any public gesture they make while they are there. For example, they can ask for the release of the, of the Munir report. They can meet with the family members of the political prisoners. There are more than 70 to 80 prisoners there. Does the U.S. Embassy do that? I mean, I'm just curious. It's, it's, <laughs> it's not to the extent that we would like. Okay. And the ambassadors, of course, they will be meeting with the right. families. But we are talking about the senior officials. Sure. That will send a strong message. And also, whenever they come here, it should be one of the top priorities, right. which we ask for everything. But in this case... If we miss this one year window of opportunity, right. things will go bad to worse there. A, qu a quick word about political prisoners. I think it would be great if the Philip Karma case got more importance. But there's another methodology which I believe the Committee on Appropriations on the Senate side engaged in, which is to take a list of political prisoners. It doesn't need to be the whole list. It could just be sort of um, high-profile cases, cases involving people who are suffering from health problems. Um, whatever. But take a list and use it either informally or even formally to hold up arms export uh, licensing. Recently, the United States licensed, I think, nine Apache helicopters for Indonesia. And the Appropriations Committee did successfully gum up the works for a little while, asking questions about Philip Karma and eight other political prisoners, mostly Malacans who had been arrested for uh, unfolding the SMS, the RMS flag, in in Papua, excuse me, in in Ambon in the Malacca Islands, but the, the, they were unable to ultimately block the sale because to do that you'd need a congressional resolution, and, and so those are, you could take political prisoner cases and gum up the works for arms export or even for outright conditionality in IMET and FMF, um, and NDAA funding as well. So that's another thing. But we, we should mention that Philip Karma is not the only no, and political I, and I, I appreciate that. And, um, um, you know, and, there, and there, is, you know, there is the defense authorization bill coming up uh, mm -hmm. and the defense appropriations bill before the House in June. So mm -hmm. um, there may be some opportunities um, to look at there. Ms. Superati, do you, have any, do you want to add anything of things we can be? 
I just want to add regarding the situation in Papua. Uh, uh, recently, we just uh, received the uh, number of cases. That is, uh, there are 40 people now is facing for the treason, treason articles. And then uh, there are 30 uh, person now still disappeared. So I just want to ask to the uh, Mr. Chairman can highlight for this uh, situation in Papua because you know even that there are uh, there are many uh, there are many um, initiative coming to the government to punish uh, the perpetrators uh, in the Papua, but then it is not uh, it is not suddenly can stop the violence in Papua. It is still still going on until now. Maybe when the hearing is over, you could just take a few minutes and kind of debrief staff on some ideas that we might pursue on that yes uh, you, you could you know when this I'll, I'll we'll, we'll have we'll have a okay mr motani any last words uh mr chairman i i would like to really uh calling for the uh peace negotiation process that we try to uh pursue the uh we have only maybe six month window of opportunity before president resign uh, as a chairman uh, of his political party, he will involve in, right. in the campaign. So I, I would like really, if any, uh, uh, as I said, we are calling if uh, resolution kind of things to recognize West Papua is to the human rights tragedy and then therefore calling for the negotiation process. I think the State Department is already policy, which is I always admire in that sense, but we need more kind of uh, uh, active uh, on that. Thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate all of you being here. And again, I, I think this is important because <laughs> uh, it, it, uh, it provides us with some important information and some important action items that, uh, quite frankly, if we didn't have this hearing, we wouldn't be doing. So, um, uh, and uh, all this information will get out to everybody on the commission. These TVs are more than just so you can look at yourself. Uh, people can actually follow what's going on here. All this stuff will be posted on our web, our, our, our web page. Uh, but I look forward to working with you on constructive ways that we can continue to improve our relationship with Indonesia while at the same time upholding a high standard of human rights. So thank you very much. You. Hearing has come to an end. All right. So listen, so we need to do a couple of things we promise, right?